Welcome, fight fans, to episode 11 of the Hooks In MMA podcast. On tonight's episode, we're going to be covering hot headline news, starting out with some of Chael Sonnen's comments on Neil Magny and Edwards recently. We're going to break that down for you, as well as an emerging strike we keep seeing over and over again, these leg strikes. It's a great strategy for some of these fighters to have. And I think it's kind of flying under the radar. So we're going to break that down for you as well. Obviously heading into easy lines afterwards for the fight night, Saturday night in the Apex Center in Vegas. We've got Overeem and Sakai headlining that card. Um, so get your bet cards out because we got some picks for you. And then, of course, two great interviews this week. We've got Cole, the Cole Train Smith fighting on tomorrow's card on the UFC fight night. He's a Canadian bantamweight. You don't want to miss that interview. And then we got a big name for you guys. We got Marlon Magic Moraes, who's headlining October 10th fight night. He's going up against Corey Sanhagen, and he's going to be telling us a bit about his career and his success so far in the octagon. So to start things off, let's break down Chael Sonnen's comments. Yeah, so uh, Ch Chael's been a guest on um, the Ariel Hawani show the last few weeks. Um, you know, Daniel Cormier obviously had stepped in there for a while leading up to his fight with uh, Stipe. And uh, Chael, you know, he's he's always been a talker. And, uh, you know, recently, um, you know, he's been gaining more and more of a reputation for not only talking, but just backing it up. Um, so he's been on, on the Hawani show, like I said, and you know, he, he basically called out Ariel um, for bringing up the same topics uh, two, three weeks in a row. And that topic was, you know, um, you know, what are we going to do with Leon Edwards next? What are we going to do with Neil Magny next? And these are two uh, welterweights who have been extremely successful. Edwards arguably could be fighting for the title next. Uh, Neil Magny with a, a big win against Robbie Lawler, potentially you know, maybe retiring Lawler, he, he could come back maybe for a fight against, you know, somebody, you know, that that's been around a while. That's not going to mean much, but good for the fans. But these two guys just, as Chael says, aren't interesting. And there's somebody in their corner, in their management team that walk in with them and they go to sign these fight deals and they're just not a get, they're not getting the big fights. Uh, and this is a big issue because, Guys like that with records like that, uh, with the guys they've beaten, and I know Z will talk to that and, and Kron's as well, but with the guys they've beaten, there is no way that they shouldn't be getting big money fights, um, title fights eventually. And, you know, he, he calls basically Sonnen's calling out the management team and the people on their side for the lack of interesting stuff and the way that they fight as well. They do everything right but they aren't overly exciting and that sells pay-per-views and that sells, uh, you know, even though there's no fans that that sells uh, the fans from home watching these fights. So uh, it is a big issue and Chael's brought up a, a bunch of different things. There's one other thing we'll talk about after, but what do you guys think about, uh, you know, Leon Edwards, Neil Magny as fighters and also Chael Sonnen calling them out. Yeah, I mean, uh, as Sonnen has said before as well, I think, maybe not a specific uh, clip, but he said, that, you know, this, this is not only the fight business, it's the entertainment business as well, right? So these guys have got to remember, I mean, certainly McGregor's, you know, a, a perfect example of it, but no one's going to be on that same level. But you have to bring something interesting, as he said, right? And I think a lot of these guys, I think, are holding back a little bit, a little bit too much. And, you know, let, let themselves their personality speak out a little bit like look at guys like Darren Hill right like he's just such a likable guy charismatic because he just he is who he is he has ridiculous posting on social media oh ridiculous. so funny <laughs> his stuff with Mike even look at Perry he's had a better back and forth with Mike Perry and they haven't never even fought each other never did but they have like one of the best fights like I don't know like outside the ring best fight stories and shit right oh, so, so good <laughs> um you know you got it yeah like and, and even Edwards had a chance he had that backstage fight with uh uh Masvidal right where he gave or Masvidal said he gave that whatever that three-piece combo or whatever <laughs> hilarious right but like you know 
he got the worst of that. So, okay, that's fine. Well, you know what, let's start something up. You guys can sell a lot of stuff, right? But they don't take advantage of it, as you said. And uh, um, uh, Magni's been a, a lot of great people. Condit, uh, um, Johnny Hendricks in there. I think there's one or two other names. But, you know, he just, after he got knocked out by... Um, Gastelum, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, Gastelum. That's another name. Exactly. Great, great name. Uh, he's doing really well still. Uh, after he got, after Magni got uh, knocked out by uh, Ponza Zibio, um, you know, he just, he kind of fell off a little bit there, right? And it's like, you got to keep it going. Look at Sean O'Malley. He doesn't even have a manager. Now, I'm not saying, you know, he's obviously, you know, he lost his last fight, but in general, I think he's been managing his, his fight choices pretty well. Uh, like like his, his opponent, um, he's obviously garnering a lot of uh, hype and, and a lot of eyes and things like that behind him. Uh, and he doesn't, you know, he doesn't have an agent. He does it himself. So these guys can do it too. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they I, I think, uh, you know, who knows? I don't even know. Like maybe have Maggie and Edwards fought each other. Maybe those two, maybe, maybe the answer is have them fight each other. I don't know. I, yeah. But I feel like Edwards beat Maggie back in the day or a couple years ago. Or uh, I don't know. I forget. No. I'm just checking right now. No, they haven't fought. And uh and Edwards is on an eight fight win streak. Like mm -hmm. it's there's no reason why this guy shouldn't be getting like it shouldn't even be a huge fight. Like there should be he should be fighting for the title. Like what? Burns Burns and um and uh Usman are fighting. They they just announced that. Like why can't he get the winner of that? Like why is he not speaking out? Why is his management team not pushing for that? He's won eight in a row. Like it's insane. Yeah. And even if it doesn't have to do it on social media, but behind the scenes, right? Like, that's the thing. Like, I don't know what's going on behind, them, but these, these guys have got to, have got to figure it out and get a little bit more aggressive, I think, with, with the UFC. Like, you guys have a, you know, you're great fighters that are not, they don't just come around, right? And those storylines. So when they happen, you got to take advantage of it right at that time. And that's what Sonnen was always great at during his career, right? Like, he was always able to get that next big fight, even when he was losing. They're yep. still able to get that next big fight. So, um, yeah, no, that's that's going to be interesting moving forward. That welterweight division is just so stacked, though, still, right? So, um, so stacked. And then the yeah. other thing I, I, I saw that he said on the Hawani show, too, is, you know, about Brock Lesnar. And he brings up Brock, obviously, he's in the, in the rumor mill because he's a free agent from WWE, sorry. And uh, Vince McMahon is always, you know, tried to lure Brock in and and back in the day when he was fighting the UFC Dana White was always trying to do that and it seems like throughout history the last like decade Vince you know and uh and Dana two guys that you know very hard-headed guys one way they don't like to share they're rich guys they're, they're trying to own that business um have been butting heads back and forth and it's like who's gonna who's gonna bite next well you know they've rumored possibly Lesnar Jones entering Jones entering into the heavyweight division that that could be a fight but Sana yeah. brings up a really good point um you know USADA isn't um active in Bellator right now so Bellator has never had Brock and you know you know Brock Lesnar is not going to pass any drug tests that like we all know that and yeah. why, why wouldn't he go to Bellator and he they rumored Fedor why not have that fight? That would that would be huge. He hasn't he hasn't burned a bridge with Bellator before, Lesnar that is, and Fedor is obviously you know he's at the end of his career. He, you know he may have a fight left or two at at most. I would say um, that that makes more sense, like Sonnen said, than bringing Jones, the best fighter ever in the history history of UFC, um, except for maybe like a GSP or whoever you want to say, um, up to heavyweight like. Jones and Jones and Lesnar would we watch it a thousand percent? But what makes sense? Lesnar without Usada and Bellator fighting Fedor. Quite a bit more sense, I think. Yeah, or throw him throw Bader at him or something like that too, right? Yeah. Um, that seems like a natural transition, and uh, yeah, I agreed with Chael Sonnen's comments. I, I think he was spot on. The other thing outside of not being interesting, he said, well, these guys don't possess the power to really 
um, command these, you know, marketable matchups and uh, title shots. So, you know, like you guys are saying, pretty stacked division. Traditionally, welterweight has always been one of the deepest in the UFC. And I feel like both these guys have been around and they almost just got lost in the shuffle. There's so many other names, so many other highlight reel knockouts going around them in their division. And they just get swept under the rug. So, yeah, partially uh, they should be a little more vocal on social media, post-fight interviews, calling guys out, getting a little bit, you know, dramatic, whatever you want to call that, showbiz. Um, it's a business, right? They're there to make money, generate revenue. And um, that's that's the goal at the end of the day, both for UFC and the fighters. So, yeah, um, I think they should be going for those knockouts uh, back to our earlier episodes talking about, Hey, throw the guy 10 K bonus. If he gets a knockout, doesn't matter what round, throw some incentives in there. I think the viewers would love it. I think the fighters are more incented and that third round when they're already up two rounds to zero, they're, they're swinging for the fences and um, I think could change things. So who knows? Um, to kind of change gears, to go away from knockouts, something we've been seeing a little bit more here. Uh, we brought it up on a previous episode, but um, these leg strikes, um, tail of the tape show, the reach advantage, just like, you know, traditional boxing would, uh, but it's kind of overlooking uh, what these guys' leg spans are, right? How far um, can they really get that range going on these these leg kicks? So. Yeah, what do you guys think? Um, we're seeing it across all weight classes, all different style of fighters, using it more and more now. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think Z wants to, you know, he'll, he'll talk about something in a second, specifics on a couple of fighters and comparisons. But I just, last weekend I had watched, uh, you know, I forget who was fighting, but they had the same reach advantage in their arms and their length, uh, their upper body. But they brought up in their lower body, uh, one guy had a five inch reach advantage with his legs. So based on, you know, where things are moving towards with calf kicks and we've seen, you know, how many more um, fights finished by leg kicks this year, like there's been like three or four. Um, they were very few and far between before we need to start not only just in the tail of the tape and explaining um, the, the leg reach advantage, because it's a mixed martial arts fight, not a, not just a boxing fight, um, but it needs to be talked about more during fights. Um, you know, I, again, I forget who was actually uh, commentating that brought it up, but that needs to be, uh, you know, happening more often because it is such, um, such a difference. And to speak to more of the sp specifics, uh, Z, if you want to talk about, you know, difference in weight classes and, and lengths in, in reach with their legs, like crazy. Yeah, exactly what you were saying. Uh, during the last, uh, I think it was the last pay per view there at Was um, you know, he they were or John Anik was saying was that uh, Con O'Malley and uh, Cheeto Vera actually had longer leg reach than Stipe Miocic as a heavyweight, and they that so that's a hundred pound weight difference, and somehow Stipe Miocic has a one inch reach disadvantage to both Sean O'Malley and, and Vera there. So that kind of shows you the body type difference and just how much, you know, that can come into play as you were saying, right? Cause it's very variable clearly from all these different weights. And uh, to, I don't know, I'm just to give an example of it or kind of, you know, kind of brought it into, um, I don't know, into kind of, I don't know, mainstream MMA or whatever you want to say. I just want to think about just Justin Gagey. Gagey, even when he was, you know, fighting for too long in uh, the World Series of Fighting, I believe it was, he was crushing guy like kicks all the time. That's what he was doing just to open up his hands. And then he was, you know, back then he was a little bit more wild. Now he's a little, you know, obviously much more defensive and more well-rounded. But he would just kick the crap out of their legs and just so they would be so worried about it. And then he would just start punching the crap out of their head and then he would end. So, you know, but like there's, I think, Paul Felder too. And you got to think at the end of the day, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert. I, I haven't had any professional fights in my life, but what I know is that, you know, it's easier to, it's, it's safer to kick a guy than it is to punch. You're further away 
from him. You know what I mean? And and it's it, it's it, you can be more defensive with it. You can get back easily. You can move around. You can stick and move easier with it. So why not try and create some defense or sorry, some create some offense with that movement, right? And um, and the judges, you know, uh, it depends where you're going, right? Like what the judges are looking at or, you know, what, how much they actually take leg, kick, leg kicks into play. You know, let's say not very much at this point because, you know, they're all boxing guys or whatever. But your opponent's going to know about it. Your opponent's going to feel it and it's going to affect their, you know, their, their fighting, uh, you know, as round by round goes. So it's, it's been a very effective technique. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more people start leg check, like, like checking those leg kicks now, or let's hope, you know, see it down the line. I think once guys start doing it more and more and that becomes more of the meta, if you will, um, the guys are going to become up, come up with the defense for it to stop it. Right. So, uh, but for now it's, it's very, very effective striking, uh, strike. Um, it opens up a lot of things as well. And, uh, yeah, no, well, it's just part of the involvement of MMA moving forward, right? So it's, it's been very, you know, very exciting. Uh, we'll see where it goes from there. Absolutely. Yep, it's just uh, part of the evolution, right? Um, yep. Guys getting more dynamic, more uh, weapons in their arsenal. And, uh, you know, it plays into these game plans that some of these guys come in and, um, you know, really zone in on that and, and, and focus on that to cripple their opponent. Um, so I guess, you know, before we head into our, uh, guest interviews, we got two, two studs here this week. Uh, we definitely have to leave our viewers with some expert picks, easy lines. Um, not the greatest of cards tomorrow night here, but we do, uh, have some money in play. Um, so Z-Balls, why don't you, uh, start us off here with, uh, some of your analysis on, uh, the fight night card here. Okay, well, you know, yeah, certainly, as you said, not maybe not the deepest card of all time, but, uh, you know, sometimes when it's like that, there's some very, very exciting fights going, you know, that end up happening, right? So even with not the greatest name, but to kind of start us off here, uh, first off, we got the main event uh, between uh, Alistair Overeem and uh, Augusta Sakai. Uh, Overeem's the favorite coming in at minus 160. Uh, Sakai's a plus 130. Overeem. You know, he's coming off a ground and pound finish with Walt Harris in May, so fairly recent. Uh, you know, he had the fifth round loss to, to Rosenstrike previous to that, uh, but he was kind of winning that fight pretty handily, pre, uh, you know, before that moment late in the fifth round. Uh, Sakai is currently on a four fight winning streak in the heavyweight division. His wins over Chase Sherman, Andre Arvlowski, uh, Tybura, and most recently a split division over Ivanov. You know, Overeem. Obviously, you know, he's getting up there. Uh, he's 40 years old, 40 years old now. Uh, but, uh, you know, he still looks just as good as ever. I don't know. He's been, you know, he's he's fountain of youth or something. He still looks great. He still looks fast in there for the heavyweight division. Um, very athletic. Um, you know, continues to fight the best of the best uh, and comes up top most of the time unless he runs into that, you know, that, that Nagano uppercut. But, uh, you know, pretty much. <laughs> You know he's he's he, you know he he's he performs very well all the time no matter no matter who it is sometimes he gets beat but you know it's because he's fighting like a top ten guy um, you know it's striking very versatile um, you know Augusto's going to go on there um, you know he doesn't really always look great of shape but his cardio seems to last or he seems to be good in there so I don't know what's up with that but um, he, he's one of the worst bodies I've seen in, in there but uh, <laughs> uh, you know he he uh, like I said he, he has success so I can't blame him. Uh, but, you know, I'm going with the experience here, uh, you know, the better, uh, you know, previous competition with Overeem. Uh, Sakai hasn't really fought anyone nearly on Overeem's level yet. Um, you know, certainly Ivanov is, is his best win, but, you know, Ivanov is kind of a, a fat guy himself. Not not great, you know. I mean, well, you know, it's certainly super tough and, and decent enough cardio, but um, he's not, I, I wouldn't put him on the same level there. So, um, certainly going to be a tough fight. Um, but you know, Overeem's going to get the uh, get the win, I believe. Uh, in terms of uh, over under profits, certainly uh, believe the over two point five um, at minus one ten. I've uh, been having a lot of success with the overs this summer and, and in general. Uh, but uh, the main event, uh, and I think it continues, uh, even though they're heavyweights. You know, I don't really see each other being able to finish each other that quickly. But uh, you know, what do you guys? think? I'm riding with easy lines. I, uh, 
you talk about doing well this summer, if you haven't invested in any of the over under picks with Ben Zeman, then you are missing out. Uh, I'll never go against you talking about <laughs> rounds. So I'm not even going to dispute anything other than I'm with you. Yep. 10, four on my side. Um, if our fans do want some early money in the afternoon, Middle Tennessee State and the Army Black Knights, under 55 total, two great defenses. It's going to be a low-scoring game. Yeah, oh, yeah. So moving on, though, to the next one here, a co-main event. Uh, we got uh, OSP taking on Alonzo Minifield. Uh, same through, plus 110 as the underdog. Um, and uh, many field minus 138. Uh, we broke it down a little bit in the previous episode, but it got rebooked here due to that positive COVID test. Uh, but you know, I'm in general, I'm, I'm going for the same thing. You know, um, same proof coming off the decision loss to Rothwell and heavyweight earlier this year. Uh, he lost to Kryloff and, and Reyes earlier, so those are really tough losses, obviously. But you know, he beat Tyson Pedro, uh, Pedro which you know is a respectable win. Uh, many fields coming off a, a decision loss to Devin Clark, which, you know, it, it was a pretty close fight in general. What's his first loss in his career? Um, and, uh, you know, has lost, or sorry, has a win over Paul Craig as well. Uh, OSP, you know, as, as you know, his fights are very difficult to call. He, he's pretty unorthodox. Uh, he does some crazy things in there. And then other fights, uh, he seems to kind of stand back a little bit. So he seems to be one of the most variable fighters in the UFC. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes his fundamentals are horrible, but we'll see what kind of happens in there. What, like what he lacks in that, you know, he, he, he makes up for these on flu chokes and all these other things that he does. Right. So with some of his flashiness, basically, right. Um, you know, Alonzo is going to look to use his power punches, of course, you know, big hooks, uppercuts, try and walk down OSP, um, you know, get him within that range because, you know, he doesn't have, obviously, you know, not as tall, um, not as, as not as much reach as I either as well. So, you know, this is a very tough fight to call. Um, you know, last time I wanted uh, OSP due to, due to the price. Um, you know, I'm going to do it again, although I, I'm not investing, you know, a ton in terms of the winners here. Uh, but OSP by decision looks like a very good value to me at plus 500. Um, also, what I'm looking at in terms of over under, uh, over 1.5 looks nice to me in terms of parlay or even straight minus 138. Uh, I don't see either finishing each other, you know, that quickly. And even, you know, end of the second round finish, which, you know, OSP has done before as well, uh, you know, that covers that 1.5 bet, of course. So, uh, yeah, that's what in terms of feeling that one. Uh, what, do you, what do you guys think? Yeah, I'm personally not touching that one. I, I just... You know, I, I like that you had said, you know, over one and a half rounds, I can definitely see it going later on in the fight. Um, but in terms of investing, I, I don't think I'm going to touch that, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. I'm with you, Z, OSP, just purely for price and um, experience. You know, he's been around. He's headlined cards before. He's, um, yeah, just great experience. So uh, I yeah. just like the value. Not going to bet the, the house on it, but um, going to be sprinkling a little bit of, uh, of units. <laughs> yeah. Little fairy dust. <laughs> yeah, like I said, OSP decision plus 550. That looks pretty interesting. Or Sorry, I think I said before plus 500, but now I'm looking at it right now live plus 550. So, um, yeah, that, that looks pretty good. I don't think Minifield's really going to go down uh, too easily either. So. Um, but yeah, if you're looking to parlay, like I said, one of those overs, uh, my personal favorite, I uh, didn't break it down too much to be on, to be up front with all the, the hooks and viewers here, but Michael Pereira, a uh, very exciting fighter. Um, I think we're looking at a prop bet here though. Uh, yeah, zone. I, I don't want to, don't want to jump on it before you, cause this is your original one. So yeah. What do you, what do you think in there for in terms of that fight? I just think with uh, the the way that Pereira fights, like he's he's all for first and second round um, finishes, and he uh, at the weigh-ins you saw him come up and he's bouncing up and down. He's ready to go for tomorrow, and um, you know his opponent couldn't. He something ticked him off. Whatever he said, 
uh, and, and kind of slapped him and hit him in the face. I think this is going to be a war and somebody's going to drop and it's going to be under 1.5 rounds. And I think what, what was under 1.5 Z was it? Uh, plus Minus 163 right now. Or sorry, no, sorry. No, no. Sorry, my bad, my plus 120. Plus 120. Plus under. 120 yeah. under 1.5 rounds. Pereira. Is it Imadayev? Yeah, that sounds right. It looks right to me, at least. Something like that. Right yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Z, yeah. And yeah, exactly. You said they, they look like they're going to try and go in there and kill each other. Something's going to happen. <laughs> something weird is going to happen. Or who knows? Maybe a DQ or something. I don't even know what, but something weird is going to happen. Like, and I think, uh, I think Pereira's last fight, there was a DQ. So you never know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah, against Diego Sanchez, uh, yeah. Sanchez, like yeah, it was like a knee to a damned opponent or whatever, right? Because thing, yeah, exactly. Yeah, something crazy is gonna happen. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, other than that, that's pretty much good for me. Do you guys have anything else you want in terms of uh, betting lines here? Just a last uh, parlay. You have to throw it in with something based on the value. But uh, Cole, the Coltrane Smith, who who's on our podcast this week, him and Hunter Azure open up the card. I like it to go to a decision. It's minus 200, so it's likely to happen, but throw it on uh, one of the things that Easy Lines has mentioned here and uh, parlay that with something else, and I, I like that fight to go three rounds. Yeah, yeah, no, I yeah. like that one, and uh, you parlay that with, say, old green money line or one of those overs there, I think that's, uh, that's a nice play. And I mean, if we're talking trends, if we're talking summer performance, just a quick stat to throw to our viewers. Hooks and alumni guests are eight and two after coming on the podcast. So, wow, Coltrane. I did not know that. That's unreal. So Coltrane could keep that trend going. He's a huge dog. We could get to nine and two tomorrow. I'm going to be putting some money on him. Bias bet, homer bet, I don't care. The keep the train going that way yeah. and i mean like guys it, it's it's got to happen right um it's too good to be true so let's go let's go cold train um let's get some units on him yep beautiful well fans thanks for tuning in this week we've got some great guests coming up next week as well couple Canadian legends, both from MMA scene and just in general, TSN sports um, background. So uh, hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to watch these interview guys. You don't want to miss them. And uh, we'll catch you next week with another episode of the Hooks in MMA podcast. Next up on the Hooks in MMA podcast, we have seven and one professional UFC fighter, uh, he's got a big fight this weekend against Hunter Azure at uh, UFC Overeem versus Sakai. It's September 5th uh, at the Apex. Cole to Cole Train Smith. How's it going today? It's going great, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. We appreciate it, uh, especially on short notice here. Um, so yeah. how's, how's training been going for you and, uh, you know, ready to go for Saturday or what? Yeah, ready to go. Training's been fantastic, you know, just put my head down, got to work. Uh, you know, I've already, I was already in real good shape before the, the, uh, fight announcement and all that. So it's been good. Training's been real good. Awesome. And we can't wait for Saturday, uh, to get here. Um, just wondering what, what got you into training, what got you into mixed martial arts and, and at what age was that? Uh, I mean, I've kind of always been into fighting. I've had three older brothers, you know, they've beaten me down my whole life. So, I had to figure out something to do, you know. Um, I think I started training at about 18 or 19, and I've been training ever since. I'm 31 now, so yeah, 10, 10 or 11, 12 years, something around there. Yeah, and you say the older brothers, um, one of them is, is your coach, correct? Yeah, one of them is my coach, yeah, yeah. Casey. Casey, yeah. Um, yeah, so just talk about some of the training partners you have, what the name of your gym is, and, um, you know, who else is in your corner? Um, uh, I have a whole bunch of different gyms, you know, that I, I train mostly out of the sound in Squamish, you know, that's like my home base, but you know, I, I travel down to Langley and I go to revolution and train with Bibiano Fernandez and Gary Mangan and Jeremy Kennedy, you know, some of the top guys in different promotions. Uh, I go down to check Vancouver. That's like 
right now I would say it's one of the the hotbeds of, of, of professional fighters, you know, training facility wise. Uh, all of them have come together and kind of trained under that roof. It's been fantastic there. I think uh, with Tristan Connolly, you know, he, he had a great fight last year and Achilles Esther Madura, he's going to be fighting in the contender series soon and Jamie Siraj and there's a whole bunch of real, real top guys there. Uh, and then uh, I go down to Roll Academy. I do my jujitsu there, you know, high level black belts, all that stuff. And I'm kind of all over the place. You know what I mean? So, yeah, being all over the place, though, with the names that you mentioned there can only make you uh, more multifaceted, right? Um, yeah. Looking, yeah. Look, looking forward to talk with uh, Jeremy Kennedy later today. And we, we talked with Tristan Connolly about a month ago, hoping he, mm. he gets a good recovery uh, and he can get back to doing what he does. Um, so, yeah, you mentioned, uh, you know, in Squamish there, that's, that's where you're currently living, but you were born in South Van. So uh, when, when did you make that, that move? Uh. I, I moved here at like the shittiest time, man, like in grade 10, you know what I mean? That's like, that's like such a vital age, you know, moving from the city, all my friends, my whole, my whole life was there, you know? And then I moved up to some shitty little town, Squamish, no <laughs> life, no, no car, no friends, no nothing, you know? And at first it was just terrible, man. I hated it here. And then, then you get a little bit older and, you know, you get your license and you get some friends and all that. And now it's been, uh, it's it's one of the most beautiful places in the whole world, man. Swamish is fantastic. If you don't know about it, Google it. You'll see what I'm talking about. It's it's a great little town, man. And and we're 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 getting on the map here. You know, we have a lot of high level athletes, and it's only growing. Yeah, well, I had a question later on about that, so um, I think maybe I got my answer. But um, I have been to BC once. Uh, Squamish obviously wasn't one of the places, just because it hasn't been on the map, like you said. But I did go to mm -hmm. Vancouver and uh, Victoria, so uh, beautiful country out that way, and and maybe I can get to Squamish one day. Um, just talk to about to uh, I guess your debut in the UFC. You beat uh, you know Canadian staple and and veteran uh, Mitch Gagnon. So um, coming into that fight, you know I. To be honest, I expected um, Mitch to to maybe beat you because I hadn't known a lot about you. But you came in and put on a fantastic performance, and and I was very very you know excited about your next fight moving after that. So just talk about you know beating Mitch and uh, what you knew about him coming in. It's funny because I didn't know anything about Mitch Gagnon no. before. I, I, I know I hate to say it, man. I know he I know he's you know he you know he was one of the best bantamweights in Canada. I just didn't know about him at that time. You know yeah. what I mean? Didn't even know who he was when, when, when they told me I was fighting him. And I found out he's Canadian and all that. And, you know, uh, he, he seemed like a super nice guy. It was a good fight. And, you know, it sucks fighting other Canadians, but sometimes it is what it is, right? I, you know, it's the only reason I got into the shows because it was in Canada and Brian Kelleher actually got hurt, you know, so I stepped in for him and, you know, it's just the way it went. Yeah, and it is what it is. Um, yeah, no, but I, we were very impressed by your performance and looking forward to many more. Um, yeah, just some of your takeaways from the Miles John fight. It, it was a split decision, and you know sometimes you know you didn't have a loss before. Sometimes that loss can make you make you better. Maybe get jitters off, whatever it may be. But just speak to that fight there and kind of what you took from it moving forward. Um, I mean, I have lost before. I played in high level sports my whole life. You know, I, get, I've been a, I guess I mean uh, MMA. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've lost as an I've lost as an amateur in MMA. You know, and I think losing is probably one of the best things that you can go through, especially early on in your career. To kind of, I mean, not too early because then you won't even make it to the UFC. But as an amateur, you know, losing is is, is a good thing. You know, uh, I don't. I have a lot of top level fighters here in Squamish, and they've been undefeated, and they want to jump to the pro ranks but i'm kind of hoping that they can fight a few more times and just get that taste of a loss because when you win you just think everything is fine you don't change anything you you know everything is great you're winning you know why change anything but when you have a loss you know you can really sit down and think about why you lost and and you know the things leading up to it right so um yeah you know i'm i'm, I'm fighting at the top level best fighters in the world I'm expected to lose eventually. Nobody goes undefeated. There's one guy who's undefeated at the moment, you know, and he's got some tough fights ahead of him and even he's had some, you know, close calls, you know? So, yeah. I mean, fighting at this level, if you can't be too bummed on a loss, man, the guys are the best in the world, you know, and this isn't boxing, you know, where you can go 40, and know, fighting a bunch of scrubs and then, then they throw you in with the big dogs, you know, in the UFC, you're fighting the best guys right away. So, 
so yeah, I mean, obviously it sucks and it sucked even more when it was in, you know, Rogers arena, my hometown in front of everybody, but that's just part of the game, man. You got to pull up your boots and tough it out and get back to the drawing board. Yeah. And that's a great way to put it. I've asked that question before and uh, it wasn't, you know, drawn out and explained like that. So I, I like that answer a lot. Um, so you're finding fighting Hunter Azure this weekend. Uh, he just came off a loss um, in that fight. I watched his fight. Um, I expected him to wrestle a little more and he actually ended up um, getting caught and standing up the whole fight, which I thought uh, took away from some of his benefits. So just looking ahead to this, this uh, fight this weekend, um, you know, what do you know about Hunter and, you know, uh, what do you think of him as a fighter? Yeah, his two fights in the UFC, he, he mostly, he stood for most of the time. Uh, his fight versus um, Katona, he, 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 he used his wrestling as defense most of the time, and he just mm -hmm. kind of struck the whole time, you know, and then obviously going into the fight with Brian, he just, you know, they just went out in the middle and started banging right away. Yeah. Uh, I don't think he's going to do that again. You know, I think he's going to go back to his wrestling because, you know, when you get knocked out like that for the first time in front of everybody, you know, it's, you kind of want to go back to what, got you to the show in the first place right and I'm, i would be shocked if he wanted to just stand and trade um so i'm, I'm expecting a, a bit more of his wrestling to come into play for this one yeah i think you're right uh but you'll be ready for that uh last last part here so it's between round segment one minute i'll ask a, a question there'll be a couple of answers you can give we, we good to go yep um favorite food <laughs> Uh, favorite food. Uh, I can't stop thinking about Popeye's chicken right now. If that counts. I mean, I don't yeah. really have a favorite man. I'm, I'm, I can eat, I fucking will eat anything except fish, anything but fish, but I like everything, man. Sweets, salty, fried, uh, everything. I'm, assume, I'm assuming Saturday or Sunday you'll get into that. eh? Oh yeah. Saturday I'm going Popeye's bro. That chicken burger is the best burger I've ever had in my life. And, and, and American fast food is on another level, man. Yeah, I agree. Uh, favorite sport other than MMA? Uh, I grew up watching, I grew up playing high level basketball my whole life, you know, so I'll say basketball. It's definitely. That's mine too. That's mine yeah. too. Um, camping or a hotel? What would you rather do? Uh, it just depends on the situation, man. You know, uh, if it, where's the hotel, you know, is the hotel in Vancouver where I live? Uh, it's, it's interesting. Camping's great. I've had a lot of, some of the best times of my life camping. So I guess for the experience, I'll go with camping. All right. Um, favorite getaway spot in BC. In BC right here, man. Squamish bro. I'm telling you right here in Squamish. It's fantastic. I thought you were going to say that. Uh, favorite genre of movies. I like, uh, drama action i don't like when it's all action i don't like when it's all drama you know what i mean i'm not really into like the superhero movies when it's just all action and there's nothing they don't make you feel anything you know yeah. uh, but joker was fantastic so movies yeah. kind of like darker yeah i like that one too um who do you think wins in a couple of bantamweight matchups here in the future uh, marlon rice or Corey sanhagen i'll go with marlon marlon's a beast man yeah, well, you, you two are going to be on the, the podcast this week, so pretty good lineup. Um, pure yawn or Aljamain Sterling, if they, if they confirm that and, and that happens? That's a tough one to call, man. They're both super good. They're both high level. They're young. They're confident. Uh, uh, I, might, I think Aljamain might, 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 uh, might get him. I don't know why. Uh, and this weekend, Hunter Azure or Cole Smith? Of course, I have to go with myself. <laughs> Uh, can't wait for that. Uh, just to finish off any sponsor shout outs or social media. Uh, my main sponsor, man, Sunny Chivas and Squamish. I cannot wait to go and eat there. They got the best fried food. They got the best burritos, man. I can't wait for some Sunny Chivas. Awesome. Uh, so we're looking forward to this Saturday, September 5th at the apex, uh, fun fighting Hunter Azure bantamweight matchup. Cool. The Coltrane Smith. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. You take care. Good luck this weekend. Thanks a lot, bro. I appreciate it, man. No, no problem. Take care. You too. Bye. Next up on the Hooks in MMA podcast, we have 23-6-1 uh, UFC fighter. Just fought for the belt recently. He was born in Nova Friburgo, Brazil. He resides in Parkland in USA. And American top team, Magic Marlon Marais. How's it going today? I'm good, man. It's always good talk with you. And I'm happy. Looks like I have a fight. And 
This is what I'm always looking. I look to put myself in danger, test myself, and earn things. You know, I want to get in a UFC, get in a cage, and, and earn everything. I don't want anything given. Yeah, and in the 135-pound the division, you're one of the most, if not the most, exciting guy. So we, we can't wait until you get back in there, too. Um, we were just wondering, uh, you know, how, how it was growing up in Brazil and some of the hobbies or things you did for fun in Brazil before you started MMA. It's tough, you know. Growing up in Brazil was tough. Money was short. My mother and father, they always work hard. And I never, I never open up the refrigerator and I have no food. I always had food, but everything was uh, really <laughs> counted, you know. So they work it hard. I'm thankful for them. I'm thankful for them. They let me go to school. I was able to go to school. I study and I grow up in, in the poor neighborhood and I was able to, to, to do what I love. You know, uh, I, I do what I love. I live off the sport and I'm really thankful, for, especially for my mother and my father, that they, they gave this to me. Yeah, it all goes back to them, right? Uh, they brought you up and, and gave you a life and, and now uh, you're, you're reaping the benefits of it. Um, so just talk about your current gym and some of the, the coaches you have, just who, who they are and some of your best training partners. I'm at ATT right now, and I choose to move from up, up north. I was in New Jersey with Frankie and all the team. And uh, after a couple of years, uh, me and my family, my wife, we decide to come down and enjoy a little bit of the weather get back to, to an atmosphere similar than Brazil. Just check it up, something, you know. Uh, after I fought Cejudo, and I was a little depressed, to be honest, you know. Uh, I didn't want to lose, I want to win. I thought I was going to win. I was very confident. I started very good on the fight. Nothing to blame on my coaches. Uh, Mark, Ricardo, Frankie, they're the best coaches in the world. They're the most knowledgeable guys in MMA I ever met in my life. I learned so much from these guys, but nothing personal, nothing uh, involving the, the, the skill set, the training, and just like mindset, you know, yeah. just like my, my mind, uh, new, new things, see new looks, and, and test myself, put myself in danger again, and that's good. That's good. I'm happy here. I've been working with Mike Brown a lot. Mike Brown's a good coach, smart guy, too. He, he's a, another one that loves the game, loves to break down techniques. And I still have my coach since I was young. I was nine years old. I started training kickboxing with him. And we we literally conquered the world. You know, we fought for the world championship. I fought, I won the, the World Series of Fighting. And we, we've been together forever. So we're still together. We're still breaking down uh, techniques. We study, we watch videos. Uh, it's not just go to the gym, work hard, and get the toughest wrestlers, the toughest strikers. It's about breakdown, you know, see what we're making, mistakes, uh, film every session, film the sparring, count the takedowns, count the, how many punches we're throwing. And we, we want to make sure we are prepared. And we're doing the best we can each fight, you know. And it's, it's the same. Uh, looks like I have a fight coming up and we are breaking down, we're studying. Uh, I've been getting some boxing sparring. Uh, in the Florida, we had so many boxers, so many pro good boxers. I, I, last week, I just fought with a very good uh, amateur, over 200 fights. The kid's like 18 years old and phenomenal, you know. And Making I've you feel sparring, young again. <laughs> I've been sparring with so many pro boxers and this kid's like unbelievable. He's supposed to go to the Olympics for Romania, but something come up, the Olympics got canceled. Uh, through all this COVID situation, and we we he end up going pro. He's gonna go pro, and um, man, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm see guys coming I mean, into the sport right now. I'm 30, 32, and I'm not a beginner. Uh, I would say I'm a veteran, and I'm trying to to take advantage of that. But I'm still hungry. My mind's young. I want to work harder than ever to showcase in my next fight and, and be the best you guys ever seen. Yeah, we can't wait. And we know you will. Um, I would be, uh, you know, I would hold myself back if I didn't ask, uh, you know, you, you dominated the world series of fighting, but you did fight our friend and, and friend of the show, Josh Hill. Um, you know, you spent over 30 minutes in the cage with him. I was just wondering what you thought of him as a, you know, as a mixed martial artist. 
I think uh, Josh is a UFC UFC level fighter. Uh, I think he's in Bellator right now, but he he, he's, he fights we, Friday actually. He fights yeah, I think uh, Eric we, Perez. We, yeah, that's good. We fought we fought in the World Series back there. He was just coming out at the Ultimate Fighter, and I think he's better than a lot of guys in in the UFC. He's dangerous. He he mixes it up. And he's hard. It was a tough fight. He gave me a tough round. Tough first first round was very hard, and and I was able to overcome and and win and scoring. But it's a tough fight. I have a lot of respect for him. I think he's one of the best guys in the world, especially in Canada. I think in Canada right now at one, one thirty-five, one twenty-five. I don't know if he's twenty-five because I I thought he was he was gonna give a try, and I think he's one of the best out there. Yeah. No, we appreciate you saying that. Um, so obviously you had a you know your family had a setback. So we just wanted to give you uh, you know our you know, condolences for going through that stuff where we hope that you're all healthy and, and the family's good because family's number one. Right. So we're, we're glad that you, you know, I think you're, you're okay now, right? Yeah, we're okay. Uh, we, we had the COVID and I, I was sick. I just had eye pain, back pain. My wife was a little, little harder. She had to go to the hospital to get checked and get like tests. And she was very weak and a lot of fever. And thanks God we fought through, you know, it was one week, tough week, but uh, and we, we kept getting better. And thanks God, I feel, feel amazing. I feel, feel great. And sometimes I'm at the bed and I think, man, it looks like I never had anything. That's great to hear. We, you know, we couldn't uh, ask for anything better. We want to see you back in the cage, but number one is family. So glad that you're, you're healthy now. Um, so you're five and one in your last six with uh, three finishes over, you know, guys that potentially, you know, talking Jimmy Rivera, uh, Aljamain Sterling that could maybe uh, fight for the title next. But you, you, you dominated those guys and you finished Sun Tzu, who, you know, you had a, a setback earlier on in your earlier career in the UFC. So you're right there. You, you, uh, you fought for the title and then you beat Jose Aldo. And then now, you know, obviously Pierre Jan maybe is going to get someone else. We're not sure, but um, basically we think that you've been overpassed for that title, but you do have this fight coming up with Corey Sanhagen on uh, October 10th. So what do you think about him with uh, regards to that fight? And, you know, how do you feel going into that? Man, you know, uh, I wasn't upset being like losing a title shot. And I was just mad because I lost the fight with Peter Young. You know, he's one of the best in the world. Right now, he's the best in the world. And I would love to test myself against, against him and be five rounds with that guy. You know, I think uh, right now he's one of the best. And I, I, just, I just thought Aldo did not deserve that fight. I think UFC gave him because all the drama with Cejudo and, and shit, all the talk. But, you know... Nothing personal. I'm, I wasn't thinking about uh, not getting in the fight. I was just mad because I lost my opponent and I didn't know where I was going to go because I knew the fight with Peter Young was a number one contender fight and who I was going to fight to to get that chance, you know. And Sandy Hagen lost to, to the guy that I, I knocked out in two minutes. So it didn't make much sense for me to get that fight. That fight was offered to me earlier. Um, for the first first time they went to Abu Dhabi and I didn't deny the fight. I just said I want to fight Cody Cody Gabriel because Cody was coming off a, a win over Asuncion and made much more sense for me fight him former champion. But unfortunately we all got contracts. He got the contract. We all agreed to fight but um, like over Sun, uh, he decided to go down 125. Respect yeah. to him. He's going to get a shot, you know. He chose either fight me and and earn a number one spot or fight for the belt. And, man, he's smart. He 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 took the easiest way. Yeah, we think so, too. Way <laughs> to the belt. So, uh, I end up getting no opponent. And, to be honest, I literally try to fight every single one from the number one to the number 12, and everyone coming off victories, and I didn't get no answer, nothing. And I, I spoke with my manager and with the UFC, and makes sense fight Cody Sanhagen, 
He's upcoming guy. He's phenomenal fighter. He's a very good fighter. Uh, people don't talk much about him, but I respect him as a fighter. I, I know his skills. I watched his fights, and I know what he's capable of. And be be there and test myself with a guy like that. And we don't know. That could be a number one contender fight. Could not, but I signed with UFC to fight with the best and test myself with the best. And this is what I'm going to do October 10th. I'm going to prepare. I'm going to train hard and I'm going to show up and one more time test myself against the best. And I think I'm one of the best in the world and I'm going to beat this guy and let's move forward and, and get another one. If not the belt, I'm, I'm going to keep fighting. I, I always said that I want to fight with the best. And if I have to do two, three, four fights to get what I want, I'm going to do it. Yeah. There's, there's no arguing. You're one of the best. You, you literally are. Um, you're going to, you're going to face Sanhagen and we, we all think you're going to win in dominant fashion. So if you do that, I think, you know, the winner of Jan and uh, potentially Sterling, if they make that, I, I'd love to see you and Jan. So let's, let's hope for that. Um, yeah, man, I'm, I'm working for that too. And a lot of people talking about this fight. And I think uh, we just need to pass through our, our opponents and Jan winning. I'm winning. We're going to bring so much more, you know. A lot of people want to watch this fight right now, but if I win my next, he wins his next. That fight is the fight everybody want to watch, you know. It is. Uh, okay, last segment. It's one minute here, so it's called Between Rounds. So I'm going to ask you a question. There's going to be a couple answers. you got to pick one, okay? Okay, let's go. All right. uh, favorite sport other than MMA? Soccer. Uh, fighting in the U.S. or in Brazil? U.S. Uh, deepest division in the UFC? 155. Agreed. Uh, your favorite fighter to watch? Justin Gage. Best music genre. So what, what's the best music? Uh, the, the, like, uh, like reggae, rip hop, or you want to... Yeah, whatever. Type. What do you like? Yeah, what do you like? I like hip hop and reggae. I would say half and half. Okay. Um, would you rather live in Nova Friburgo, Palm Beach Gardens, or other? Nova Friburgo. Uh, knockout, submission, or a three-round domination? What would you prefer? Knockout. Who wins, Khabib or Gaethje? Gaethje. <laughs> uh, what about Garbrandt or Figueredo? Figueredo. Uh, Yan or Sterling, if that happens? Yeah. Sterling. And Marais Sanhagen? Marais. And Marais Jan? Marais. I like that answer. Uh, any sponsor shout outs or social media you wanted to tell the listeners? No, man. I want to thank uh, American Top Team. You know, they've been amazing with me. I'm here for a year and three, four months. And, and man, Dan Lambert this is a great guy, and he takes care of the fighters really well you know i saw during this whole pandemic the gym was shut down and he was there every day you know supporting supporting the fighters and means way more for this guy you know he doesn't need the mma i think it's his passion and the way that he treats uh the fighters is amazing you know and that's it man thanks my family my fans and i can't wait to get back in there man man i feel like I need to let let this monster inside of me go because being so long since December I didn't get in the cage and I, I'm excited. I thought I was gonna fight in June and we got pushed over and in October you guys gonna see the best fight that you guys ever seen. Uh, I'm 100% sure of that. Yeah, uh, we can't wait for that. We came became a huge fan after you know watching the fights with Josh and and coming into the UFC. You've been nothing but exciting. Uh, can't wait to see October 10th against Corey Sanhagen. Thank you so much for your time, uh, Magic Marlon Marais. This is Hooks in MMA. Thanks so much, man. Appreciate it, my friend. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you, you too. Thank you.
Falling in and out of love, in and out of love with you. Falling in and out of love, in and out of love with you. Falling in and out of love, in and out of love with you. Falling in and out of love. Yeah.